Leonardo da Vinci wrote in one of his uh, books. Study the science of art. Study the art of science. <laughs> Okay, so this talk is entitled The Art of Science, and what really inspired me to talk about the art of science was initially just my, my life history. I was always interested in art when I was younger. Fine art, origami, I'm a black belt in origami, you could say, well, from the age of 10 or 11. But with origami, I started teaching pupils how to do the origami, and there is an art to doing that, showing them how to do all the paper folding and then inspiring them to, to want to do it in the first place. I did that from quite an early age, at junior school. And then later on I got into my literature and English and languages, but then I decided to do science A-levels. <laughs> Walter Gropius, who set up the Bauhaus movement in the early 1920s, another nice link between the sciences, engineering and, and, and the arts, he felt that art and engineering need not be estranged. Of course, he developed that wonderful angle-poised lamp that we still use today that was very futuristic, even today. Uh, that dates from the 1920s. So very interested in function and form and very interested in making sure that whatever an engineer designed also had some aesthetic value as well. And my other influence was the great Leonardo da Vinci, a polymath of the Renaissance. And this is what uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote in one of his uh, books. The principles of the development of a complete mind. In that chapter he said, study the science of art. Study the art of science. There's me thinking I was being original. <laughs> Centuries ago, Leonardo da Vinci had already thought about this. Develop your senses, especially learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. Well, basically, as someone has my talk. Because I wrote an article um, for Physics Education in 2004 and commissioned some other authors to write articles about the connections between art and science. And I spent some time in Cornwall, uh, a very culturally enriched county, uh, teaching pupils in a private school who were very bright, very motivated, very aspirational. But I perceived, even though I'm a scientist, I perceived this, this sense that it was the sciences that were being pushed very strongly, not by the science faculty, not by me, the deputy head, but by parents because they saw that as a utilitarian way to go and make more money and to possibly pay back the enormous fees that they were paying. What I tried to do was fight against that and promote the arts and the connection again between the arts and the sciences. I was very lucky at the time Falmouth became a university and Falmouth is a great culturally enriched university and what I went to, I went to a talk by the professor, one of the professors of fine art there and she talked about the biggest growth uh, in the UK market for industry, which was the creative industries, the creative and digital industries. The creative industries range from advertising to architecture and fashion to film, which constitute one of the fastest growing sectors in the UK. So I thought that was an interesting thing to try to project as an important facet in helping people to make a decision about their future career. Whatever career people go into, I think it's important they continue to make connections between ideas. Because out of that, as I've shown, come great new ideas as you synthesise things that you've been exposed to. Medicine and the arts connects what he was working on, of course, and what I'm about to say next. When I lived in Falmouth, medicine was quite a, an important subject for some of our students. But at the Peninsula University in, in Cornwall, what they were doing in, in one term of their medical course was enforcing this on the students, many of whom had just studied uh, biology, chemistry, physics, maths, maybe a bit of uh, grade 8 piano en route to becoming a medic. And what they did was they made them produce an art show. And most of them absolutely hated this. And the reason that the professor of medicine made them do this was to make them feel uncomfortable, deliberately, because their lives had been blessed up to that point. They were clever, they were hardworking, they were successful potential medics. Made them feel uncomfortable, just like the parents that were going to treat, so developing an empathy. And the second reason was, he said, I want you to learn how to see. Look at things carefully. Look at things in close detail. Don't assume that you know what you're looking at is what you're looking at. Look in more detail. And by drawing, 
and by using other forms of art, that's what you do, and also interpret what you see. And that connects with Gunter von Hagens, who did that wonderful Body Worlds uh, exhibition many years ago. I went to the exhibition in 2002, and I think you could probably find some excerpts, uh, video footage of that wonderful exhibition. And he talked about artists and scientists of the Renaissance like Leonardo, Vesalius and Dürer, who embodied the last time when art and anatomical science were indistinct. And it's a wonderful display, a plastidation of sadly some, some cadavers and chopped up bits and pieces from people's bodies, but displayed in a very artistic way, but in a way that reveals the anatomy in detail that up to that point had not been revealed apart from through photographs and drawings. And of course, before the advent of photography, before the advent of photography in 1839, all of the anatomy that medics and scientists understood was conveyed through the art form of clear, detailed draftsmanship. One of the first people to, to do this, a very in great detail was Robert Hooke. You may think of Robert Hooke as being the man that suggested putting masses on the ends of springs to stretch them and plotting graphs of force against extension to see if you got direct proportion, straight line through the origin, up to the limit of proportionality and all that kind of jazz. That is the kind of physics uh, that students study at school. But Robert Hooke, no, he's the guy that wrote the book Micrographia. And in that book, not only did he write things about anatomy, not only did he write things about ants, not only did he write things about fleas, not only did he write things about cells that he'd seen in cork, but he drew very detailed pictures, wonderful pieces of artwork in their own right, wonderful pieces of detailed draftsmanship. And for centuries, that was the way that information was conveyed through the art form of the scientist who was both artist and scientist. So images, visualisation and, uh, and, uh, and that, that kind of modelling that uh, art and science uh, connect with. And, and also the, the next topic, um, number two, is science and art and their mutual influence. And yeah, I'm a bit of a butterfly. You might find that some of the ideas connect with other ideas and jump all over the place. That, I think, is what makes science fun. It's what makes art fun. And sometimes you're not quite sure what I'm gonna say next. But here is Gary the Gorilla. And I'm really proud to be giving this talk today on behalf of Gorilla Physics. And here he is, Gary the Alliterative Gorilla. Uh, the reason we give these talks is because we believe in conveying ideas and sharing ideas. Everything I've said today are ideas I've picked up by listening to other people or reading about other things that other people, cleverer people than me, have conveyed either through word or visual imagery. What I want you to do is to like some of it, subscribe and share. The most important thing for me is that even if you don't understand everything I've said, you want to go away and find out more. Talk about it with your friends. So like, subscribe, share. Gorilla Physics. David the Duck, Gary the Gorilla, Nick Fisher saying goodbye and thank you to Kit, Betts Masters and Gorilla Physics. <laughs>